Hello, and welcome to Horror Court Trash Over, the show that discusses all of the masterpieces and all of the trash pieces of genre cinema. I'm Gary. Hi, I'm Shay Diaz. No, oh, for fuck's sake. <laughs> yeah, we need to address this, actually. <laughs> we need to address that a few episodes back, Chris was talking about how much he loves and just like that. Um, <laughs> we both enjoyed it when it first started, and then after that two episode starter, things went downhill rather quickly. So just on record, our taste is not that bad. No, we we are aware that, and just like that, is is now turned into trash. It's become a struggle. It has. It has become a struggle. <laughs> None of the characters we once loved are the same anymore. I've given the benefit of the doubt, but it's, yeah, it's not right. It's, it's no. just not right. No. But I'm still enjoying watching it. I'm not going to stop watching it. Anyway, that's not why we're here today. <laughs> we're not here to discuss and just like that and no. Che Diaz. We are here to discuss an absolute classic. Just the the, the film that is, is the epitome of why we, we do this podcast. We're here to discuss Trog from 1970. Yeah, so last week we discussed a well-known trash to piece where the leading lady didn't fully commit to the role. Uh, You know, and that's no slight to Whoopi Goldberg. You know, she clearly wasn't interested. (laughs) This is very much the opposite. Yeah, uh, yeah, again, a uh, a Uh, slave queen with a man in a suit. Yeah, (laughs) and a leading lady that fully commits to the role. (laughs) A bit too much. Maybe a little too much. <laughs> well, first of all, please provide the backstory as to uh, how we own this film. Yeah, so me and Gary, we've been in a relationship nearly five years now, and we love films. We love Blu-rays, DVDs, all that business. So when it comes to Christmas, there's always going to be the potential that we've bought each other the same <laughs> gift. Because we enjoy the same things. And it's never happened. Never. It never has. Until the Christmas just gone. Where we both <laughs> bought each other on DVD, <laughs> Trog. <laughs> and I, and at the time we said, I don't think there's more on-brand gift that we could have bought each other at the same time. <laughs> yeah, now after uh, watching it, we can confirm that is very on brand. It's spot on. <laughs> this is... Oh, it's just everything. It's just everything. This is, like, the, the gayest trash to piece ever. I mean, you've got Joan Crawford over acting, uh, as always. Uh, men exploring caves in their underwear. I mean, Trog himself is clearly a gay icon. Um, well, yeah, I suppose so. So... Yeah, let's just let's yeah. It's camp. Directed by Freddie Francis, who is quite is quite prolific. Um, his filmography for directing includes The Brain, The Day of the Triffids, Nightmare, Paranoiac, The Evil of Frankenstein, Doctor Terror's House of Horrors, The Skull, The Deadly Bees, They Came from Beyond Space, Torture Garden, Man in a Suitcase, Dracula Was Risen from the Grave, Mumsy Nanny, Sonny and Girly. Oh. The Vampire Happening, Tales from the Crypt, the 70s one. The Creeping Flesh, Son of Dracula, Tales of Witness Madness, Legend of the Werewolf, The Ghoul, The Doctor and the Devils, etc, etc. It goes on. Uh, it's quite a filmography. Yes, very um, Hammer and Amicus heavy. And is also the cinematographer for The Straight Story, Cape Fear, the remake. Uh, Return to Oz, Dune. The Elephant Man, The Innocence, Never Take Sweets from a Stranger, and the music video for Never Ever by All Saints. <laughs> um, also, his two Oscar winning cinematography. Films. Yeah, what were those? Uh, Glory and the other one I can't remember. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, but you know, two time Oscar winner for cinematography, worked with David Lynch over the yeah. years as a cinematographer, really prolific director. You made this? And I make her a trog. <laughs> I don't know the budget or how much it made, uh, but I can tell you it is the final film of Joan Crawford and what a way to go out. Yeah. Um... I mean, 
it really, everyone knows Joan Crawford for her over the top nature and. Well, they know Joan Crawford as to interpreted by Faye Dunaway. Yeah. Let, you know, in fairness, um, the films we've watched her in mainly have been later career. Yeah. So, um, Whatever Happened to Baby Jane and After. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, Mildred Pierce is one of my favourite performances ever. So she's she is a proper actress. Yeah. She she was never really known as a proper actress, but you know she she was yeah and um, but it's I think for her this was a sad end mm. and a sad final film for her. For me, I am living <laughs> <laughs> because this is the best final film. <laughs> I think the the final scene really sums up. Um, how she probably felt about it. But she just walks away. She just doesn't want to say anything. She just walks away. She does. <laughs> she just... Yeah, she's had enough. She's like... Get me the fuck off this hill. Um, in the first week of release, it was the number one top grossing film in the United States, making $2,009,583. Yeah. I mean, then let's... Let's be honest here, and I don't really want to get into it too much because it is a discussion, a tale as old as time, when people are like, oh, you know, this shit, you know, why is this shit made? Why is this crap made? Bitch, there's an audience for it. Yeah. There was an audience for Joan Crawford (laughs) talking to a man in a really bad (laughs) ape suit. You say really bad. Uh, The ape suit is a leftover monkey outfit from Stanley Kubrick's 2001 Space Odyssey. (laughs) Yeah, let's be fair here. It's part of a leftover costume. <laughs> because that was full monkey, that was. That was full ape yeah. in 2001. This was like par. <laughs> this is, yeah. This is like bare shaved leg. <laughs> and some cute little caveman fucking trainers on. Whatever the fuck he was wearing. This is a low effort Halloween costume. This <laughs> <laughs> oh, I can't be honest. I'll just shove something con. Make myself look like a caveman. I've got this mask lying around from 2001 Space Odyssey. It really, that. Well, genuinely, that is <laughs> probably how they did it. Joan Crawford's adopted daughter, Christina, still on speaking terms with her mother, was asked to attend the movie's premiere in Joan's place. Afterwards, Christina says she got a call from Joan Crawford asking her what she thought of the picture. She said, what can I tell her about this? It was the absolute worst piece of junk, so I told her it must have been a grueling picture to be on. Working with all the stuffed animals, and she hung up on her. <laughs> <laughs> After seeing the film, Joan Crawford supposedly joked that if it hadn't been for her end-of-life convers- uh, conversion to Christian science, she might have committed suicide due to her embarrassment of being in the film. Oh, that's a bit harsh. <laughs> <laughs> um... <laughs> Of course, Crawford was then on Pepsi Cola's board of directors, um, demanded product placement for Pepsi Cola and all of her later films. In this one, terrified villagers run past the Pepsi stand whilst fleeing Tron. <laughs> I, did I mean, that. I'm glad they used it during the best scene of the film, <laughs> yeah, the best yeah. sequence. Um, this is the second of two films that Joan Crawford made as a favour for a personal friend, Herman Cohen. The first was Berserk, uh, which also starred Michael Goh from. Uh, Batman and Robin fame and about all the... All uh, the Batmans up until... Christopher yeah, the Nolan. original four. Yeah. Um, or should I say the Tim Burton two, the odd one in between, and then Batman and Robin. Um, well, the, the two Tim Burton ones and the two Joel Schumacher yeah. ones. Uh, he, yeah, he's, he's an interesting character in this one. <laughs> um, he's serving Tory the house style boots. <laughs> Uh, we own Berserk, don't we? We do. We, we do. need to watch that. That that's not William Castle, though, is it? No, no. I think. Oh, was it British then? I think it is British. Oh, yeah. okay. Uh, Joan Crawford reportedly supplied her own wardrobe for the film due to its very low budget, and what a wardrobe that is! Oh my god, you can tell <laughs> she is serving. Her uh, her spelunking outfit is is what we should all aspire to wear when we go exploring caves. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was maybe a little too fun. It was... <laughs> You'd think she would have worn, like, a... Well, we'll get into it. We'll get into it. 
The dinosaur scenes were done by Willis H. O'Brien and Ray Harryhausen for the Irwin Allen film, The Animal World. Yes, we get to see five full minutes of The Animal World in this film. And Ray Harryhausen is a legend in the business. Yeah. Um, but that film was made in 1956. Yeah. This was made in 1970. <laughs> and it shows. Um, Rona Newton-John... Olivia Newton John's sister plays a reporter in this film. <laughs> she does. Always with the big glasses. <laughs> the film is listed amongst the hundred most enjoyably bad movies ever made in the Golden Raspberries Award. As it should founder be. Founder John Wilson's book, mm-hmm. The Official Razzie Movie Guide. Yeah. Uh, it is of course one of uh, John Waters' favourite films as well. Yes. <laughs> I can imagine, yes. <laughs> At the end of her life, Joan Crawford cited this as the very worst movie she had ever made. Uh, but today it is almost universally hailed as an all-time camp classic. It does have its audience now. Um, it is. It is definitely gone into a cult film status, hasn't it? Yeah. No. Absolutely. There. There is, and I always say there is an audience for this kind of stuff. There always is. Yeah. Everyone who listens to this podcast. Everyone who listens to this <laughs> podcast. Yeah, I would fully recommend. Um, is it the worst John Crawford film we've watched? I think it is actually. I would probably say so. I I can honestly say I don't think I've watched a Joan Crawford film I haven't enjoyed. No. So far. No. Um, what was the... Well, I know the William Castle one was good. It was the remake we didn't like. Yeah. Um, the oh, um, telephone. Telephone. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, we've done so many uh, films. Fuck, what was it called? I Know What You Did. I Know What You Did. That's Is it? Yeah. I Saw What You I Did. I Saw What You Did. I Saw What You Did. Jesus Christ. Uh, during filming, Joan Crawford's rumoured to have laced her multiple glasses of Pepsi each day with liberal amounts of vodka in order to be able to recite the film's dialogue with a straight face. There we go. <laughs> and it, it, I mean, it worked. She, she really, she's really trying. Whoopi Goldberg should have took note <laughs> for uh, whatever that film it was last week or Rex. <laughs> So getting into the film, a sympathetic anthropologist uses drugs and surgery to try to communicate with a primitive troglodyte who is found living in a local cave. Yeah, yeah, very. it's very fortunate that uh, it was discovered in a cave very close to her, <laughs> wasn't it? Oh, <laughs> Joan Crawford is available everywhere and anywhere during this film for any scene that requires her. Yes. Like... She is the most convenient... Her character is the most convenient character in cinema history. Like, there's a scene later on where someone gets murdered and she's literally just sat on a bed doing nothing, ready to go and explore. <laughs> <Ready to> go. <laughs> one thing... Um, one thing about this film that I've found... No, I've lost my train of thought. No? No, I'm sorry. Okay. Well, starting off... Oh, with... yeah, excuse me, my sincere apologies. One thing that this film has in common with I Saw What You Did... Yeah. That I thought was gonna it was gonna have in common with I saw what you did. Is Joan Crawford getting top billing but being on the screen for like ten minutes? I, I generally I didn't think Joan Crawford would be in this film so much. Oh no, this is this is her but film. But this is her film. Whereas <laughs> I saw what you did, she's top billed cast, but she she's barely in it. Yeah. Yeah, no, this this is very much Joe Crawford's film. Someone laced um, my Pepsi with vodka. I had no idea what I was talking about then. Um, we get obnoxiously large font for the title. Oh yeah, T R O G Trog. <laughs> yeah, opening credits for the soundtrack and uh, Malcolm, Bill, and Cliff doing a bit of hiking. Um, they're walking on grass for ages, but for some reason, you can only hear their ridiculously loud footsteps a few minutes oh in. Oh my god! Like it just randomly started. Like they've been walking for ages. Crunch, crunch, crunch. <laughs> you think was, it was like leaves, it was like dead like, leaves or something? It's just grass. It was like, like crunch, when, crunch, crunch. <laughs> it's like when you're in college, and I mean, when I was doing film in college, and you'd add sound effects, and you'd never know the right the right volume for adding in people's footsteps. And it sounded something like this when you got it wrong. It was like when uh, like squeaky doors. Like, yeah. <laughs> like we could have just had them walk and the soundtrack's playing. It's fine. We didn't need to hear their footsteps. Well, we know they're going caving because yeah. they've got hard hats on. And they're uh, really trying hard to pretend to read a map. On this, <laughs> they're not really travelling that far. Um, they have surprisingly posh accents to begin with. Oh, it's all over the place. But then they're... At, um, I'm assuming they're played by British actors, though. I think Joan Crawford's the only American. 
Maybe, but it, they literally don't know how they, they want to say it. Every, <laughs> every time they talk, it's a different accent. Yeah. But um, they start off very quite posh. It's like, oh. um, they find a hole they randomly, don't they? <laughs> yes, they do. <laughs> and climb straight in. Super excited. Yeah, Cliff, uh, Cliff is the first to reach the bottom of, of his section. Well, yeah, um, a rock, does a rock fall on one of their heads? And like, a, rock hey, falls, someone, <laughs> a rock falls hey, on, someone uh, I think fun? it's Malcolm's head. It's like, hey, somebody having fun? Hey, somebody <laughs> having fun? Um, they all reach where they need to be. And uh, one of them says, wow, I never expected this. This is a breathing cave. No footprints. We could be the first humans down here. Yeah, the cave exploration goes on a while, doesn't it? Without too much happening. There's, like, there's no conversation between them. It does. Um, I do hate when films do. Like, have a little conversation between I know we're trying to get from one point to another. I don't know what they were planning on doing down the bottom of this cave. Uh, I'm not sure what they're... I, I'm, yeah, I'm not sure what they're looking for. Well, I think we find out soon Fossils. enough when Bill, randomly out of nowhere, starts stripping down to his boxers and goes exploring in an ice-cold pool. Now... If you are professional splunkers, uh, the actual term for it, by the way, um, if you if you are professional splunkers, then surely you'd have some sort of diving gear with you for the occasion. Well, look, I'm not. You know, I suppose they weren't expecting to find water in there because they'd never seen that hole before. Well, they didn't know what they'd find. Yeah. So surely you'd just take it just in case. Oh, I don't know. I, I, I'm not a professional spelunker. But, you know, because the director wanted a bit of homoeroticism, um, we have Bill stripping down to his boxes, followed by Cliff, who also does it straight after. Um, Malcolm is a bit on the fence, though. Uh, he he stays fully clothed whilst watching the other strip, and he's like, oh, well, I'm a bit curious, but I'm not joining in. <laughs> yeah. I know when to stop. Uh, Bill makes it to the other side. Well, before before he does. What before he does? But no, Cl- Cliff. Before Bill makes it to the other side, Cliff is like, "Wow, Malcolm, if that's how you feel, then it is just me and Bill from now on." <laughs> Kick him out of their little gang. Um. Yeah. I suppose no, so. Yeah. Well, <laughs> that's what he says. I suppose Malcolm's issue is that he thinks that they're gonna die at the other end. And it turns out Malcolm's right, because Bill makes it to the other, the other side and continues to explore his underpants on dry land. <laughs> For so long. Cliff joins him soon after, again still in his underpants, and out of nowhere, Trog appears and beats <laughs> Bill to death. Yeah. Um... Cliff finds him and swims back. <laughs> Malcolm like, what's going on, what's going on? And he <laughs> grabs Malcolm and he's like, He's dead! He's dead! <laughs> oh, bloody hell. Uh, yeah. Dramatic zoom in on the zoom face. Back he's on. dead! Malcolm, he's dead! <laughs> it is so, so over the top um, and really sets the bar for how how over the top this film becomes as it goes on. Yeah, it, it's peaks and troughs, isn't it, with the film. It becomes overdramatic and it's whoop, back down, up and then down. Because um, we go to Dr. Brockton. Yeah. And played by Joan Crawford and she's visited by Inspector Greenham. Yeah, she's a renowned anthropologist, isn't she? She is, who happens to live really close by. Uh, <laughs> She's visited by Inspector Greenham, who wants to talk to her and Cliff. Inspector Greenham's uh, repping the moustache for this film. He is, yeah, yeah. Props to him. A uh, quite Fine a beefy moustache. one. Moustache, yeah. Well, he's a yeah uh, inspector in a film in a British film from the uh, early seventies. So of course he's got a big moustache. Um, I was a little surprised that he wanted to speak to Doctor Brockton and Cliff. <laughs> And then Dr. Brockton says, Cliff isn't up for it. He's in shock. Um, he's not really going to be able to talk to you. Why don't you talk to Malcolm? He was there and he headed the expedition. And the inspector seems shocked that Malcolm... <laughs> like, Who's Malcolm? Who's this Malcolm? And like, but you know who Cliff... Like, what, what's going on here? Why, <laughs> why do you not know who Malcolm is? Did you just happen to be around as well? And just like, <laughs> who's this bloke you got, Dr. Brockton? <laughs> Um, yeah, very confusing. 
Um, yeah, Dr. Brockton visits Cliff, and he's still he, he's still on that same level that he was at in the uh, in the cave. He's like, the eyes, the eyes and the face, it won't leave me. Yeah. Um, so he starts describing what Trug looked like to Dr. Brockton after she asks him. And he's like, monstrous, like nothing I've ever seen before. Dr. Brockton is not satisfied with this answer and wants to know more. So she asks... How large was it compared to a human? Did it crawl? Did it make sounds? <laughs> yeah. She's trying to get him to spill the tea, but um, he's not really... Is he in the rest of the film? Is this the last we see of him? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a weird one because the inspector questions Malcolm on why they brought Cliff to Dr. Brockton. And he said, oh, it's because she lived close by. But Dr. Brockton isn't, a, like, a medical doctor. No. She's an anthropologist. <laughs> conveniently. So, conveniently, an anthropologist. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm assu- I, I can see why the inspector would be concerned about that. Yeah. Malcolm tells Inspector Greenham uh, about what happened before suggesting that uh, to Dr. Brockton that he starts working with her. Uh, but this just leads to her asking more questions again about what Trug looked like. A lot of her dialogue in this film is just her repeating herself. It's always, it is. he is the missing link. He is what we're studying. Or, before that point, it's, what does he look like? What does he look like? Yeah, she's very much about him being an opportunity to lift the veil from the past. <laughs> um, I've got here, Joan does try her best with some bad dialogue. <laughs> She so she has to go to the cave and uh, to the cave to the cave and look for the creature herself. Um, so she's absolutely serving in a splunking outfit. She is uh, full face of makeup. Full face this, of makeup. This is what all this is what cave explorers should look like. She goes down there. She's in a snazzy pants. She is she's serving a bit of uh, of Debbie Salt, isn't she? She's serving Debbie Salt, but um, the if I remember correctly, the trousers are quite loose. Yeah. <laughs> I think it should be a little tighter to her body or she's going to get it caught on a rock. But, you know. What makes me laugh about this scene is that it's, it's very much a bizarre series of events because at the start of the film, you know, we have to see him strip down and go in pools and find the cave and do all this exploring and everything to find Trog. It's a lot of effort. She literally goes down there with Malcolm, goes to one hole in the wall, gets a camera out, and fucking Trug is there, posing and lifting up a rock for her. Yeah. Like, he's yeah. there waiting for her. Like, how the fuck did you find him so easily? You didn't do anything. It's true. <laughs> and he's just like, oh, hey, Joan. It's like, lifting up a fucking rock. Well, I don't think you'd get Joan Crawford in her bra and knickers <laughs> doing a little swim. So I think that was out of the question. Oh, you know she said to the director, look, just make this scene fucking quick, okay? Yeah. Just, just have him yeah. ready for me. <laughs> I'm wearing heels, for fuck's sake. And then it cuts immediately back to Inspector Greenham, and he's like, oh, are you fucking kidding me? This is bullshit. Like, with a picture of Trog in his hands, like, ah, oh, this is a load of shit. This is just like a student rag week. Oh, this is fucking fake. Well, it is. So he thinks it's either a prank, or I'm not sure if they're allowed to say it in the film, a uh, threesome gone wrong. <laughs> uh, because also, one big thing about this film that makes it so ridiculous uh, the biggest thing and it's not Joan Crawford trying to give a sincere performance <laughs> it's the costume it, it is the costume <laughs> I think we need to take a little time to talk about the costume because it makes everything that happens in the film ten times more hilarious yeah it, it is ridiculous it's, so this inspector is like no this looks like you know a prank by the university students and do you know what i've seen better interpretations <laughs> on nights out at university of cavemen or whatever this was going for um it's it's a gorilla ape head i'm assuming yeah. that's the part taken from 2001 i think so it looks damaged. It yeah. looks like it's had a rough time in those, what, two years? Mm-hmm. It looks like it's had a rough time. Then there's kind of no hair on the body, really. Just It's got dirt. a hairy chest. Yeah. 
But I don't think that's consistent throughout the film. <laughs> I, it's like shoulder pads made of hair or, or some... It, 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 it genuinely looks like they just rolled him around in a bit of mud, stuck a caveman outfit on him, and then the, the ape head. That's... Yeah, it's got, he's got like furry boots on. It, yeah, the boots are the best part of the outfit. <laughs> it's just... It's giving me um, the, the Raquel Welsh film. Uh, a million, a million years BC. A million years BC. So it's given that interpretation with an ape head on it. Do you remember the uh, early 2010s when those when the huggy boots were in fashion with girls? Hugs. Hugs. Hugs boots. Hugs, yeah. Hugs. That is exactly what it looks like he's wearing. It does. Like furry. <laughs> yeah, it's just furry boots. Um, he looks like he's sitting on the back of the bus listening to end dubs <laughs> after a roll around in the mud. But there's no, like, the hair, literally the hair looks like he's had his legs waxed. <laughs> there's no hair on the arms, really. Just just dirt. So it, it actually does look really shit. And <laughs> sincerely, you would think it was. If somebody gave you a photo of that and mm-hmm. said, we found this guy in a cave, you'd be like, you're taking the piss, mate. This is stupid. <laughs> it's absolutely ridiculous. Get a grip. Is, is a troglodyte a real thing? Do we know what it's being modelled after? Yeah, so I'm, I, I believe troglodyte is a real thing. And, um... Okay, yeah. It, a hermit or a person who is regarded as being deliberately ignorant or old-fashioned. Oh. That's what it is. Um, no, it's, it's a... No, no. Troglodyte, I mean, is a human cave dweller. I mean, looking... A person who lived in a cave. Okay, well, that was Google's... um... Yeah, but uh, modern interpretations would be a hermit or if someone's... um, A person who's regarded as deliberately ignorant or old-fashioned, it would be because... You know when people say, oh, have you been living under a rock or have you been living in a cave? How have you not heard of, you know... Um, Ariana Grande or looking on Google Images I really don't know how they got this interpretation that looks um, like a lizard I mean this genuinely looks like a lizard there's other pictures where it looks like a xenomorph from Alien um, <laughs> but one thing they all have in common none of them look like the fucking thing in this film no no so that <laughs> if one thing is clear a troglodyte whether it existed or not in in you know prehistoric history did not wear furry boots. <laughs> Ugs. Like, I, I just don't understand why the boots were a good idea. Just stick a bit of hair on his feet. Like, make him look like a hobbit. Just put a fucking ape costume, for <laughs> God's sake. Um, but yeah, it, it, it's something. Um, and, but Dr. Brockton suggests that she's going to go to Scotland Yard. So suddenly, Inspector Green was like, Do you know what? No, you're absolutely right. It's real. Yeah, absolutely real. You just... Dr. Brockton explains what it is in great Joan Crawford fashion. It's like, half man, half ape, drug, a primitive cave dweller. <laughs> so the news have turned up at the cave, haven't they? The news uh, crews. Well, not just uh, the news crews uh, for peak television, by the way. Um, the police, ambulances, peak television, locals... And an ice cream van. <laughs> ice cream van? There's an ice cream van in the background. Was there? Yeah. Well, that makes sense. <laughs> they show up to watch people trying to bring Trog out of the cave. Yes. Uh, also included is Sam Murdoch. <laughs> Local businessman. Local businessman and top tier Tory, Sam Murdoch, <laughs> who is absolutely fuming. And he will continue to be fuming... For the rest of the film. Yeah. <laughs> even though it doesn't even make that much of a difference to him. I mean, you know, there's an ice cream van there. There's tourists there to see it. It's, it's actually probably doing good for the town. Um, but he's there to start... <laughs> ice cream sales. <laughs> and start to, he starts bad-mouthing Dr. Brockton. Um, starts shouting in her face about drug being fake. And how this has all given the town a bad name. Yes. Um, so they're trying to get Trog out of the cave. They're at the water part now, aren't they? Yeah. And there's a live newscast mm-hmm. where Trog... With Alan. Alan, with Alan, Alan newscast. Trog <laughs> appears from the water, <laughs> suplexes a diver, <laughs> and then chases the camera crew out of the cave. 
<laughs> I was there and I was like, what's he doing? I was like, oh my God, that's a suplex. <laughs> Literally suplexes this guy with his um, scuba gear on. I was like, oh, fuck. I just love how every time Trog appears, he just appears out of nowhere. He does. Just jumps out of the corner. Of some He's very mess. stealthy for being like how many million years old. <laughs> um, Trog is seemingly scared by the sun on a day when there's clearly no sun out. Well, he's lived in a cave for, well... For all his life. Well, it shows, this, it shows this so shot. So he hasn't seen any sun, though, has he? Yeah, but it shows the shot of the sun, and it's clearly a completely different day. Yeah. The, the... Oh, it's a dawn. <laughs> it's, it's a very dawn day. If if anyone um, listening isn't from Britain or hasn't visited <laughs> Britain, um, it's a very, what we would call an overcast day, <laughs> where it's not very bright. Um, but there is a shot that looks straight at the sun yeah. for some reason, even though it definitely looks cold and chilly. Uh, Trog kills the peak television camera crew. I know. He um he throws a large rock, a large, very fake-looking rock, <laughs> at the cameraman who's trying to get a close-up for some reason. Like, everyone else has ran off, and this one cameraman is doing his best Blair Witch project. Oh, we've got to get the shot for the documentary. Um, then another member of the crew tries to hit Trog with a light... <laughs> But then gets thrown to the ground and seemingly dies, I'm assuming. Yeah, and all whilst this chaos is going on and everyone's running away in terror, Dr. Brockton stands steady with her hypo gun and shoots Trog. Yeah, it takes a couple, doesn't it, to get him down. She loves a hypo gun, doesn't she? She mentions this hypo gun many (laughs) times throughout the film. Uh, She's like, fetch me my hypo gun, fetch me my hypo gun. (laughs) Uh, we then cut to Trog, who's now in a cage, and Dr. Brockton is holding a big bucket of fish heads. <laughs> yeah. Um, she's she's taken him back, she's chained him up, uh, and she believes that they need to get the public on their side to give them the chance to really study, study, study Trog. Yes, we're introduced to Anne, kind of, she just kind <laughs> of appears, It's no, it's not explained till the next scene who she is. But it's Anne, who is Dr. Brockton's daughter. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Brockton having quite a strong American accent and her daughter Anne having a very British <laughs> accent. Um, and she's, Anne says, what's on the menu for Trog? <laughs> and what, what is on the menu for Trog, guys? Fish and lizards. Fish and lizards. Um, Anne warns him not to eat too fast or he'll get a tummy ache. <laughs> Not so fast. You'll get a tummy ache. <laughs> and then when he starts really much and down, she's like, oh, for a senior citizen, he certainly has a marvellous appetite. <laughs> and I've, just, I've literally got here, who is Anne? Where has she come from? <laughs> and it's like, oh, she's Dr. Brockton's daughter. It Dr. Brockton, um, she gave birth to her in between scenes. Oh, lovely. She just <laughs> trot came out daughter? that age. No, Dr. Brockton. Oh. She, she gave birth to her in between scenes. <laughs> oh, lovely. Um, the press and Sam show up to see Trog. Sam is fuming again. Absolutely fuming. Because no one wants to buy land with an ugly demon running loose. Yeah, he (laughs) thinks Trog would affect his plans to build a housing project in the area. And like a true Tory, he's obsessed with the taxpayers' money. (laughs) Everyone gathers around to look at Trog whilst Dr. Brockton explains his backstory. And and yet again... (sighs) Explains that she is the that he is the missing link and she needs to study him. Uh, oh, Sam's she's got an obsession with like on hind legs. <laughs> this, this is the link between ape and man <laughs> emerging from the jungle on hind legs. Sam um, he uh, interrupts and says, "Poppycock, insane nonsense." And Poppycock and Doctor Brockton in an interesting name. Dr. Brockton uh, responds to this by saying, you would exterminate anything you didn't like or understand. What gives you the authority to sentence a living creature to death? What? So, this is the first instance of this film trying to have a message. (laughs) And it's a message throughout. So you watch the trailer and it's a horror film about a cave dweller going on a rampage killing people, Joan Crawford needs to stop him. Yeah. Blah, blah, blah. What the film is actually about, for the majority of it, is Joan Crawford trying to stop um, (laughs) 
this Sam Murdoch character from having Trog killed <laughs> because she thinks he's a real human and <laughs> Sam thinks he's an animal. And it's, I'm assuming, this big thing about capital punishment. Yeah. Like, killing living creatures. <laughs> I d- I, I'm not 100% sure. But throughout the film, there seems to be this moral question, isn't there? Yeah. Um, on whether it would be right to kill Trog or not. Um, and is, is he responsible for his own behaviour? Which I ain't being funny. It was not what I signed up for. I mean, I mean, it's fun and it's camp and it's silly, but uh, <laughs> I'm sure a lot of people in 1970 would be like, "The fuck is this?" I I just saw it all as an allegory for Joan Crawford protecting the gays. To be honest. Oh, uh, maybe, <laughs> maybe. Was Joan Crawford an ally? Oh, of course. I mean. <laughs> she, you know what, she she's was probably she's an practically ally. a drag queen. So. She was probably an ally because the, the gay hairdressers always did her hair just right. <laughs> <laughs> it can't be that bad. They always get my hair just she right. She definitely said gay rights. <laughs> um, Sam insists the monster should be killed and quotes the Bible. Dr. Brockton corrects him with the Second Amendment and says, Thou shall not kill. <laughs> she does. Um... <laughs> Then she says a word that I never thought I would see John Crawford say, which is sperm. When she, <laughs> when she suggests that Trog was frozen for all this time. There's no evidence. It wasn't in the no. budget to show him frozen. In a lot of very similar films, you would have seen the frozen creature brought back to life. But she's just assuming this. And she says, well, you know, you can freeze sperm. You can freeze... <laughs> Chicken legs. I don't, I don't know. What but the thing them. is, what makes me laugh is how the writer um, covered their backs here. Um, the writers covered their backs because she was like, uh, "Well, if anyone else has any better explanations, <laughs> every single time she is questioned, she turns round and says, the science will prove it. <laughs> yeah, science that'll prove it. Yeah. Uh, in a bizarre series of events, a photographer takes a picture of Trog with the flash on. Trog goes fucking batshit crazy in his cage. And Dr. Brockton's like, you fools! I told you not to use any flash photography in here! And then we immediately cut to the next scene where someone's like, bye, Doctor. Bye, Doctor. <laughs> that's, well, that's uh, old sister of Olivia newton John, yeah. isn't it? Bye, Doctor. <laughs> it's like, okay, you gonna deal with that scene? Yeah. Did, did he just calm down? <laughs> um, also, as all these reporters are leaving, Sam is still going on. Yeah. <laughs> Inspe- he threatens Inspector Greenham with a town meeting. Whoa. Whoa. Right. <laughs> That's so Tory. That he is such a Karen. And Inspector Greenham says he can't do anything without a court hearing. Uh, Trump, um starts tweeting astronaut toy. He, was that what that was? I wasn't really sure what that was. Yeah. Um, and is fuming. <laughs> no, Trog, no. And then Trog's like, ah! Just starts screaming at her. Dr. Brockton scolds Anne for raising her voice and suggests a lighter touch. <laughs> Which is quite ironic if you've ever watched Mummy Dearest. Uh, <laughs> um, she says we're dealing with a backwards child here. Um, which is a very awkward part of this film. Um, where she compares the... Um, compares Trog to... Uh, maybe a, a a hand, you know, a mentally handicapped yeah. child, um, which is a bit awkward. Um, she then shows Trog a doll, uh, of a little blonde doll, that you wind up at the back, and it walks by itself. And together with Anne, they teach Trog to wind up this doll, for himself. And see it walk. Trog's like, girl, now you're talking. Yes, that's what I want. That is, you know, gender is a construct. <laughs> and if he wants to play with, you know, girls' toys, and um, you know, he's allowed. And whilst he's doing it, though, Anne and Dr. Broxton just sit there smiling at him. And they're sat like this for so long. Yeah. Like... <laughs> oh, yeah. Let's be clear. This doll does not walk fast. <laughs> <laughs> He then starts lifting up his smashed space toys like, 
And and Joan Croft's like, oh, I'm Trug. Oh, you. Um, before a montage of Trug learning to, how to play with toys. Uh, yeah. <laughs> they go from toys to colours next. No, music. Oh, was it music? music? First. I thought it was music. Mm. Oh, I thought it was colours first. No, it's music first. Dr. Brockton and Anne start playing some slow and calming music. Oh, I must apologise. I thought it was colour because my notes said, then, serving in light blue and a pink scarf, <laughs> Dr. Brockton <laughs> tries music therapy. <laughs> um, yeah, she she is. She The outfit is something. Um... She puts on some calming music, which causes Trog to do a slow dance whilst walking towards his cage. <laughs> then she puts on some slightly more upbeat music, which causes him to go crazy in his cage. <laughs> they put the slow music back on and he starts dancing again, to which Dr. Broxton says, Well, as the man said, music have charms that soothes the savage breasts. <laughs> Who said that? <laughs> Okay, number one, who is this man? The man. She can't back up anything she said. The man will prove this right. And secondly, what the fuck is a savage breast? It's basically like saying... Uh, Are you touching savage breast? Um, oh, no. So, if you must know, the man who said that uh, was a character in William Congreve's 1697 play, The Morning Bride. Oh, and it was... Is he just called The Man? Uh, it's just the character... Is he, in, the character's called The William Man? William Congreve's 1697 play, The Morning so Bride. So she's technically right, yes. but without explanation in uh-huh. Google, it would completely go over our heads. Um, yeah, basically. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, yeah, what's a savage okay. breast? I have no idea. Um... <laughs> They start showing him different colours, and he's fine with blue, recognises green, and is absolutely fuming with red. I hates red. Hates it. Um, Dr. Brockton starts telling him off by repeatedly going, Trog! 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 <laughs> and he takes her pink scarf off and puts it on himself. He does. It's a, it's a nice look for him, to be fair. <laughs> Joan's like, yeah, surf, bitch. Then we get introduced <laughs> to another character... Um, Dr. Selborn, who works at the clinic, uh, he tries to get involved, but Dr. Brockton sends him off to do some other work, and he's absolutely fuming. Yeah, so who's the best person he could go and speak to? Uh, Sam Murdoch. <laughs> so I think he goes to the pub with Sam Murdoch. They're both old white men, <laughs> so they've got something in common. And Murdoch suggests that the issue is that a woman is in charge of the clinic. In classic Tory fashion. Classic <laughs> Tory. Oh, this woman in her bloody leftist ways, <laughs> trying to be nice to this animal. Um, obviously, Dr. Selborne agrees, because he's, again, an old white man. <laughs> um, and they hatch some sort of plan. I mean, that never really comes to fruition. No, no, it just ends with uh, Sam saying, I know I'd like to see a man in charge instead of a woman. Uh, and then it ends. I don't think he was that count. Let's not. <laughs> I don't think he's on our side. Thank you very much. Dr. Brockton and Anne take Trog outside and start trying to teach him how to play catch. He initially tries eating the ball, but then starts rolling it back and forth. A dog sees this and gets really jealous, so joins in and starts barking at Trog. So they have a wrestle for a bit and Trog kills it. Trog just kill this poor dog. <laughs> Um, after Dr. Brockton says, get my hypo gun. <laughs> Anne, fetch me the hypo gun. <laughs> well, she never does. I mean, we never see the hypo gun again, do we? <laughs> um, we finally get a court case, don't we? Yeah. It actually is taken court. of court. inquiry. Um, so at the court, Dr. Brockton just keeps repeating herself <laughs> about Trog I'm being... I'm studying the Trog, link. the missing link. And Murdoch just keeps... It's just heckling her. Heckling her. Ah, you silly bitch. <laughs> but he keeps repeating the same thing over and over. It just abs- if, it's not the longest film in the world. But if anything could be cut, it's these fucking court scenes. <laughs> well, Dr. Salborn, the absolute snake, uh, starts telling the judge how dangerous Trog is. But is lost for words when asked if he ever tried telling Dr. Brockton how dangerous he is. Exactly. To which Dr. Brockton says, Your Honour... I consider Dr. Salborn's conduct treachery. 
<laughs> that was the moment I was like, oh shit, she's taking this seriously. So the yeah, so the judge is like, yes, yeah, slay bitch, you can yes. you can keep Trog. So she's like, uh, Doctor Selborn, there's no need for you to return to the lab. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> what voice do you give in Joe Crawford? <laughs> Faye Dunaway as Joan Crawford in Supergirl. <laughs> Uh, Dr. Brockton shows film of Trog playing to the world's top scientists. Yeah. So the top scientists have all come to visit. <laughs> she says, in an age when man can launch an expedition <laughs> to the moon, I think we should clarify the history of man's origin. Which is pretty much what she said throughout the... She keeps saying the same motherfucking thing, but just with different wording each time. Well, she it all means <laughs> the same thing. She interrupts herself this time. So before I continue, thank you all for taking time out of your busy lives to be here. And there's one scientist in particular who looks like she's fucking fuming. Um, but she's actually really grateful. She's like, scientists of all nations have a common cause. I consider it a privilege to be here. It is... You look really angry. Shouting. Yeah. <laughs> Why so aggressive? Uh, Dr. Brockton and a bunch of surgeons conduct... Uh, this is all the scientists, actually. Uh, they're all surgeons now. Yeah. Surgeons, um, scientists, professors. <laughs> they do some sort of surgery on Trog's hairy chest. Uh, and one of them reveals that if the operation is successful, Trog will be able to talk. Yeah, this was the weird thing that wasn't explained. So Dr. Brockton keeps explaining the same thing over and over again. And then we get this random surgery scene. <laughs> and I'm like, why are they putting a device in his chest? That wasn't explained beforehand. And then it was explained after that if successful, Trog will be able to talk. For some reason, this also leads to them hooking his brain up to a machine um, while showing him pictures of dinosaur bones, which then causes him to have flashbacks to his favourite film, The Animal World, uh, where we watch five minutes of it, consisting of uh, a dino- dinosaurs wandering the earth. One, uh, they're trying to eat each other. One kills another. All with a, cr- a really crappy red filter, by yeah. the way. <laughs> One kills another before another dinosaur jumps out of the side of the screen. <laughs> and uh, fights the other one before they have a tumble off a cliff. Another dinosaur is born, and we see another two attempt to fight before a volcano erupts and kills all of them. In the full five minutes of footage from the animal world. Yeah, and then the Ice Age happens. Yes. Yeah. Um, Why is he... <laughs> and the thing is, after it shows you Dr. Brockton and the scientists, and they're all gagged. They're absolutely yeah. gagged after watching these flashbacks. How can they see his flashbacks? <laughs> is that not where they've hooked to his brain up? But they're showing him pictures. So why is it gone from showing him pictures... So suddenly his brain is projected onto the screen. <laughs> exactly. And also, scientifically speaking, Trog and the dinosaurs wouldn't have been around at the same time. So I don't know why... <laughs> yeah. And also, why is he standing around watching all this happen? <laughs> like, just watching the volcano erupt. Just watching the Ice Age happen. Just stood there watching. Not, like, the camera's not moving. It's all, like, static camera. <laughs> so if this is one of his memories then he's just like stood there like yeah great okay this, everything's just <laughs> gone to shit um, it's like in films and Scream does this a lot um, That's uh, but a lot of films do it but Scream does it when a photo like in a newspaper yeah. is clearly a publicity still <laughs> and it's like who was there with a camera <laughs> like you <laughs> Um, well, uh, this somehow causes him to speak. Yeah, it works. And he says, Anne, red, green, blue. Someone's like, he spoke unbelievable. And Dr. Brockton <laughs> looks at him with a straight face and absolutely delivers this line of dialogue like no one ever could and says, yes, Trog spoke. <laughs> Like, yeah, we were all there before. <laughs> Best line delivery of all time. She absolutely meant every second of that. We should... The thing is, at the end of the day, Joan Crawford is old school. 
in terms of like real old school. <laughs> no offense to her, but it's a bit. She probably. I think her first film was like a hundred years ago. Um, so she would have learnt to fully commit to yeah. every single role she was ever given, whether it be background or just a dancer at the beginning. She would have. She would have been taught to fully commit. Um, and that's that's no slight on her, and like I, the comparison with Theodore Rex, it's no slight on um, Whoopi Goldberg, the fact that she absolutely did not commit in any <laughs> way to that role last week. Um, but it, it really helps with the camp factor. <laughs> it really helps make this film so watchable. It's just this delivery of the lie. Sure. It's like, and she must know how ridiculous ridiculous this whole thing is uh-huh. she must know and just that line delivery and when it's delivered to the shittiest looking costume <laughs> it's just it's impeccable it's it you cannot this kind of thing never happens deliberately no it never happens if somebody tried to do this film and you know um and make it work. It would never no. if make it into an actual comedy. It would never work. Um, you you mentioned to me that Schlock, the John Landis film, yeah. is um, a parody mm-hmm. of this and and films like it. I think is it this one in particular? No, this, this in mainly particular? in films from the fifties. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I don't think you could make this film. As hilarious as it is. I would love to see, and I say this a lot on the podcast, but I'd love to see a disaster artist style film showing the making of this film. Because I can only imagine what it was like on set. It was, um, it wasn't featured in Mummy Dearest, was it? No. But it was featured in Feud. Mm -hmm. So I watched Feud, uh, and we've mentioned it a few times on the podcast. Um, But I think it went with the, because a lot of Feud you take with a pinch of salt. Uh, But it definitely went with the story that the budget was so low, Joan Crawford had to get changed in her car uh, or in, like, you know, um, public toilets and stuff she had to get changed in. Which, according to, you know, the director was not true. It -hmm. wasn't true at all. Because I think think this is a low-budget film, but a director as prolific as Freddie Francis, who had a lot of films under his belt... And an Oscar mm-hmm. for Best Cinematography before this film. I don't think they would have made Joan Crawford get changed in the backseat of her car. Um, but, you know, that's the story that prevailed. But it would be very interesting to uh, to really see what went on. <laughs> Especially in the mind of poor Joan Crawford. Yeah. <laughs> Um, Dr. Brompton informs the court that Trog can now speak and is praised for her efforts. The court's like, girl, you have fucking done it. Ah, uh, he be, was. You'll go down in history. He was giving her her flowers. He was like, yes, <laughs> queen. Sam is fuming, continues heckling and is kicked out of the court. Dr. Brompton's just like, bye, bitch. <laughs> yeah, finally. I've, but the thing is, throughout both of these court scenes, the judge is constantly like... If you say one more thing, Mr. Murdoch, I'll throw you out. And then he says something else. If you say one more thing, Mr. Murdoch, I'll throw you out. And then finally he gets thrown out. But then the scene ends anyway. Yeah, and then he breaks into Dr. Brockton's clinic, smashes it up and releases Trog from his cage and says, Go ahead, missing Link. If that's what you are, you should be missing. (gasps) Sick burn. A sick burn. The library is open. The the fucking Tory library is open. (laughs) Um, because he can't, you know, take any sort of defeat. He goes full Donald Trump. He does. <laughs> um, he then leaves the clinic, but before he can get in the car, Trump jumps out of nowhere and throws him around for a bit before killing him. Yes. Yeah, out of nowhere, Trump jumps out from a tree, seemingly, and beats up Michael Goss, uh stunt double <laughs> in a bad wig. Uh, he then kills him in the car. Yeah. We're, and does that very cinematic thing that I, I'm pretty sure doesn't happen in real life where someone dies and the horn just goes on. <laughs> he wasn't even on the horn, was he? No. Come on. Um, and, anyway. But what's uh, Dr. Brockton doing whilst all this is happening? She's randomly sat on the edge of her bed <laughs> in her 90. Dude, fuck off. The light's on. 
So, I don't know what time Murdoch broke into the... You would assume it was the dead of night and everyone <laughs> should be asleep. But Joan Crawford's just sat there at the edge of her bed. Doing nothing. Staring in space. <laughs> Such a stupid shot because she's genuinely doing nothing. Like, <laughs> what's the purpose of this? But it's almost like a shot from Mummy Dearest. <laughs> <laughs> She hasn't. She's got a full face of makeup, of course. Her hair's done right, <laughs> even though she's about to go to bed. Here's the horn. It's like, Christina, get me the axe. The high poker. <laughs> Christina, get me the high poker. <laughs> um, yeah, it's preceded by an even better scene of her running, <laughs> trying to run with Malcolm and Anne. It's some of the gayest running I've ever seen. <laughs> she's, it's, yeah. <laughs> They're not going quick. <laughs> Um, and when she the... tells Trog that she's fought worse monsters for years in Hollywood, <laughs> <laughs> but Trog just runs away, doesn't he? Yeah, so like, Malcolm, get me my hypo gun quickly. Um, but Trog pushes Anne and Malcolm out of the way. <laughs> Not she... her on her ass. The last we see of Anne, isn't it? She's yeah. knocked on her ass. She's in a little. Um, I don't. I don't know what you would call it. Nighty. And <laughs> Doctor Rot is like Trog, Trog. <laughs> Trog goes for a nap in the woods. He does. Yeah, he just <laughs> he runs <laughs> off. He's a little tired. He's been woken up in the middle of the night. The police are gathering and planning on taking him down, and he's just like, oh, "I just want a nap. Yeah. <laughs> just tired." Yeah. But I don't think the cave's that far away. <laughs> he could have made it back to the cave. In um, a bizarre series of events. In the an best amazing, sequence of the, film. the best sequence of the film. The highlight, apart from Joan Crawford, the highlight of this film. Trash cinema gold. Um, <laughs> Trog is just going for a walk down the street. Down an empty village. The streets are empty, so it must be like first thing in the morning. Um, <laughs> a grocer and a butcher um, walk out of their shops. They must, have been, they must live in their shops. They walked out of their shops. Ah, oh, good morning there, mate. Oh, yeah, it's going to be a good day today, isn't it? Oi. Um, Oi. <laughs> The grocer spots Trog stealing some apples. <laughs> Oi, what are you doing? Freezes. <laughs> the funniest shot. <laughs> Just him freezing, staring at him. This guy's acting <laughs> is so over the top. He's then killed by two apples to the head and is thrown through his shop window. Yes. The butcher attempts to attack Trog with a meat cleaver. But at four years before the Texas Chainsaw Massacre is released... Trog takes him and hangs him up on a meat hook. He does. And this hook goes through his neck. It's and more graphic than Texas Chainsaw Massacre. It is. <laughs> I mean, it's shoddy work. It, but... <laughs> it must have inspired it, clearly. I mean... You think Toby Hooper <laughs> sat down and watched Trog? Of course. And thought, ah, yeah, I'll use that. Another local nearly runs Trog over. So Trog tips his car to the side, which in... Horrible trash of a tradition. We only cover films that do this. The car just explodes. Explodes. It's tipped on its side and explodes. <laughs> I'm sure that's not how it works. <laughs> he then goes to the park, which is <laughs> full of children. Yeah, he goes to a playground. A playground. Oh, it's a park. It's a playground. Playground Whatever. in a park. Which is surprising, considering the streets were so empty. Why are the streets so empty in the village, but the playground is full of kids? <laughs> um, he terrorises them very slowly. <laughs> Don't know if he's hurt his leg or something, but he's walking very slowly. <laughs> Apart from one... <laughs> All of them run away and escape. Apart from one girl who is at the top of the slide... Sees what's going on, <laughs> screams, and then decides to go down the slide whilst continuing to scream very loudly. <laughs> Trog grabs her. She's a, uh, she's a, a small blonde girl, reminiscent of the doll that he yeah. so the wind up doll. Um, so he decides, in the grand tradition of King Kong, to kidnap this girl. Yeah. And take her to the cave. Whilst her mother is completely overacting in an ugly she, floral outfit. She is hysterical in a floral dress. <laughs> <laughs> he then takes her to the cave. 
Didn't she? Yeah. It, he takes the little girl to the cave. Um, the army, police and Dr. Brockton show up. The girl's mother then appears, <laughs> even more hysterical, in a floral dress, <laughs> and threatens Dr. Brockton if anything happens to her little girl. She really gives her all this scene. She does. <laughs> Um, Dr. Brockton and the inspector try to have a meaningful conversation on capital punishment. <laughs> By this point, I was like, oh my God, every time she, like, you could sense that she was going to have a big long speech either about <laughs> science or about killing. And, uh, I was like, oh, I've switched off now. <laughs> um, Dr. Brockton then decides to go into the cave alone. Yes, well, she begs the authorities to let her go in and blames Sam for letting uh, Trog loose. Uh, but Dr. Uh, Inspector Greenham's having none of it and insists that Trog is destroyed. But, you know, she's Dr. Brockton, she does what she wants, so she struts her way she does. into that cave. She has got her splunking outfit on. She has. Uh, <laughs> she goes into that cave whilst Pink Panther style mystery detective music starts playing. It was really out of place. <laughs> this, this soundtrack is really weird for this one. But Trog just jump out of nowhere. Trog! Trog! Um, she manages to get Trog to give her the little girl. Um, so she's reunited with her mum who's still overacting. And she says, you see Colonel, Trog can be reasoned with. <laughs> Um, instead of reasoning with Trog, though, the army decide to blow up the cave. Yeah. They enter. They fire guns like stormtroopers. Like, are you serious? Like, there must have been about 100 rounds yeah. shot at Trog, <laughs> who was very clear, like, clearly there. And none of them hit him. No. Until, finally, a few of them do. He falls uh, straight onto a stalagmite mm -hmm. and dies. Yeah. Um, a reporter tries to question an upset Dr. Brockton, but she just walks away. End of film. Yeah. She pushes his microphone aside and slowly walks away she from does. the scene. And that was Trog. Was Trog. The end of Joan Crawford's career. The end of Tron uh, Joan, Tr <laughs> Joan Crawford's career. Um, Ended in style. Yeah, do you know what? <laughs> Yeah. Good honour. Yeah. <laughs> absolutely fucking ridiculous. It is in absolutely no way whatsoever a good film, but it is so entertaining. It is Trash the Peace, the best example of Trash the Peace, and there's just so much to enjoy. It It's top tier entertainment. I would, I would, if you're listening to this podcast, you must have in some way similar taste to us. You have to watch this. I fully, 100% recommend watching this film. Yeah. Um, absolutely. Yeah. So good, we own it twice. Watch it during Pride Month. <laughs> the best time to watch it. <laughs> oh, every month's Pride Month when it comes to camp cinema. It's true. Uh, so if you've already seen it and you're a fan of Trog, uh, let us know on social media. We're Horrorcore Trash over on Facebook and Instagram, Horrorcore Trash on Twitter. I'm DeadAtGaz92 on Letterboxd, GazCruise92 on Twitter, and Gazmo205 on Instagram. I'm Chris Barker 823 on Instagram, Twitter, and Letterboxd. And don't forget to give us a rate, review, and subscribe on iTunes, like a follow anything else. Give us a rating on Spotify. We'll be back on Friday for this week's double episode week, uh, where we will be discussing My Bloody Valentine for the first original versus remake of the year. Yes, so just in time for Valentine's Day next yep. month. Uh, next month. Two great films, actually. Yeah. Yeah, two good films. It'd be interesting to compare uh, the two of them. And then next week, uh, throughout February, as, as we usually do, I don't... I think Women in Horror Month, I don't think... It used to be an official thing. I think it's like Women in Horror Movement now. So it's like all the time. Um, As it should be. But And, and of course, uh, we're always celebrating Women in Horror on this podcast. But specifically, we'll be doing two episodes uh, with female directors next month. And two Valentine's episodes. So starting off with the female directed Strip to Kill next week. 
Yes, love stripped to kill. That's gonna be fun to discuss. Yes, there's a, a lot to say about that film. Absolutely it's great. Uh, but we will see you before then on Friday. Bye. <laughs>